Sonic the Hedgehog is back after leaving such a sour taste in our mouths five years ago. Sonic Frontiers is out now and is already making huge waves amongst gamers for more reasons than one. It's the first Sonic game of its kind, introducing what the devs call open zone gameplay. The obvious Breath of the Wild comparisons were made, the initial gameplay left a very poor first impression on everyone, but amongst all the hate, a cautious wave of optimism arose. I myself was a bit optimistic after the EGX showcase. I could see things I could enjoy. I watched a bunch of videos of people explaining their experiences with the game and it gave me a sense of excitement. Finally a Sonic game that I can bite my teeth into. Something that the movies that I really like can coincide with. I'd be lying if I said I expected a lot. Sonic hasn't been doing too hot the last decade or so. Say what you will about the games and what they have, I think it's fair to say, besides Generations, all the games aren't universally loved. You have people who say Generations is the best boost game. Others will swear by Sonic Colors, and you may have a Sonic Forces Defender here or there. But Sonic, across the board, isn't universally praised like almost all the Mario games are. The franchise Sonic used to rival back in the day. With that all in mind, Sonic Frontiers almost feels like a last stand for Sonic. Sonic will always sell. His iconic design is just too cool not to. I'm well into my 20s at this point, and I still love the blue blur if you need any evidence. What I mean by last stand is in terms of what Sonic Team can do with the Hedgehog. It's fair to say Sonic Team hasn't done the blue blur any justice recently. If Frontiers isn't what people want, where do you go from here? Can't go back to the boost formula after Forces. They clearly don't want to make adventure style games. Every other idea they've had hasn't panned out, but Sonic Frontiers is out now, and the big reason a lot of you are here is to know what I think about it. Before that though, a quick history lesson. With this being the first video I make on Sonic, I think a bit of my background is necessary. Right out of the gate, it's worth pointing out I have not played every major Sonic game. I've never played any of the boost games besides a tiny bit of Generations. I didn't play Sonic Lost World, didn't waste my time with the boom garbage, and the only handheld title I've played is Sonic Rush. The only games I've gone through start to finish are the classics, the adventure games, as well as Heroes in Sonic 06. There's already a lot of other videos where you can see those games, so I'll keep this short. I love the Sonic Adventure games, both as a kid and as an adult. Now that I have a better understanding of how games actually work, Sonic Adventure 2 specifically is what I think is peak Sonic. I prefer this sort of open world setup and adventure, but Sonic Adventure 2 man, that game is just such a fun ride from start to finish. I don't think any of the games I've talked about are perfect. For Sonic specifically, that will certainly never be the case. But they really do capture the thing that makes Sonic special. And the music, ugh. I mean, almost all the Sonic games have at least a few bangers, but the 2000s definitely hit different. Just listen. You know me, the fighting freak Knuckles, and we're at Pumpkin Hill. You ready? I ain't gonna let it get to me, I'm just gonna creep. Down in Pumpkin Hill, I got some fun, my little speech. I know that it's here, rock a sense it in my feet. The great Emerald's power allows me to feel. I can't see a thing, but it's so After 06. Sonic took a massive shift with Sonic Unleashed introducing the boost mechanic, and when I saw this, I was not a fan. I wasn't burned by Sonic 06, it had its problems, but I liked what 06 was striving to do, and as a kid, I didn't know any better. But when the boost was first shown off, man, I was turned off almost instantly. Everything I loved about the games I played just ripped away in favor of a default button to essentially skip everything? Hard pass. And after Unleashed, colors came out putting the boost formula in almost strictly 2D segments? Yuck. So I stepped away from Sonic, and if I ever got an itch, I'd play the adventure games on Steam with mods. I have gone back and played a bit of Generation since I heard that's the best boost game, and honestly, I'm still not a huge fan. Now, I don't think it's this hot garbage that I'll never finish, I think it's fine, but even still, I couldn't find the appeal other than Generations being an anniversary title. When I compare them directly, the boost games were a direct response to the sometimes slower, more methodical gameplay of Sonic Adventure 2. The extra characters were dished so we can focus on Sonic going as fast as possible. I know the catchphrase is, gotta go fast and all, but I felt like I was going fast enough in the adventure games. Slowing down never felt like a problem for me besides the occasional jank that every Sonic game has. The boost button wasn't necessary, and to be honest, it feels like it was added in to hide how poorly Sonic controls in most of these games. This is no joke, I straight up can't get past the first two minutes of Sonic Forces. Want to see how long I lasted? Just watch. Truly terrible. It's safe to say that I'm not nearly as attached to Sonic as some people are, and for me that's okay. 
I'm totally fine just taking each game as they come because Sonic, in its most basic form, is something I like. The too cool for school attitude, the way Sonic is designed, the concept of going super fast, all even now puts a huge smile on my face. It's a huge reason the movies are such a high moment in Sonic for me. Did I think the movies were going to be any good? Of course not, I was expecting them to be trash. And as a film, I don't have too much good to say. But as a Sonic fan, I love them. Especially the second one. It's filled with fan service that hits all the feels for me. But they were just a glimmer amongst a pile of titles I had zero interest in. I felt it was necessary to explain my history with the blue blur to add context to my thoughts on Frontiers. I'm coming in from the perspective of someone who hasn't experienced a lot of the level design in the Boost games. What I believe this offers is a fresh perspective without any of the fatigue from playing the previous titles. In all regards, Sonic Frontiers is my first Boost game in the franchise, something that does have me a bit worried. So after all this, over 10 years of games I didn't want, how can I be excited for Sonic Frontiers? Well it's simple, it looked different to me. The open zone stuff piqued my interest regardless of how dumb the term sounds. Seeing as I haven't ever been an active member of the Sonic community, I wasn't letting any of the negative takes bring me down or the positive ones get me excited. Sonic is something I'll always find cool, so if the game looks a bit interesting to me, I'll more than likely give the game a chance. And after all this stalling, I think it's finally time to talk about it. The next mainline entry in the series, this is Sonic Frontiers. The way I played Frontiers, I'd say there are three major aspects to break down. The open zone, cyberspace, and the story. So for the sake of keeping things simple, I'll tackle each part individually. Let's start with the only thing that had me remotely interested in Frontiers in the first place, the open zone gameplay. Instead of just having a linear stage with your goal being to get to the end, Sonic has a huge landscape to explore with your priority being to collect a bunch of you can accomplish this two different ways. You can stick to just having Sonic boost his way through on the ground using the move set I'll talk about separately to get from place to place, but the more common option for pretty much everyone else who will play Frontiers will be to traverse the world through the many, many, many obstacle courses present throughout each island. These obstacle courses are split up between 3D segments and 2D segments. Typically at the end of each course you'll either be rewarded with some rings or you'll get a boost in the air to either start another course or to get back on the ground usually to a place you wouldn't be able to get to normally. As you traverse each island, Sonic will be searching for the Chaos Emeralds for reasons that should be obvious by this point. For those unaware though, Sonic will collect all the Chaos Emeralds so he can go Super Saiyan, transforming into Super Sonic. But how do you get the Chaos Emeralds? Well to do that you gotta play Cyberspace. But how do you play Cyberspace? Gotta defeat enemies to get these portal gears. So on and so forth until you get the thing you need to do to progress the game. A pretty simple gameplay loop. One I would enjoy a lot more, but we'll get there. Sonic also needs to collect a character specific object to give to them to progress the story, or to view some of the side story. You also have to collect skill points to learn new skills since that's a thing. Gotta collect Coco's, Frontier's version of Korox to upgrade your speed and ring count, and attack and defense seats to upgrade your defense and attack levels. Lots to collect in such a vast space. On paper, it seems like quite a bit, especially if you decide to go for 100% completion like I did, and it could be a lot to keep track of. How would you possibly do that, especially when the map starts out blank? Well, you have these small challenges you'll find that, upon completion, will reveal a bit of the map until you complete all the challenges. Sometimes you'll have to step on some spaces to change their color, other times you'll have to chase some rings, shoot some balls and hoops, and much more. Completing the map in its entirety will unlock fast travel between cyberspace portals, which eases finding the final collectibles significantly. That's a lot of stuff to do, especially for a Sonic game. The only game I'd even remotely compare Frontiers to in terms of sheer things to do from the games I've played are the adventure games, that being purely down to chow grinding. It's the first original idea from Sonic I've seen in quite a long time, but a lot of Sonic's appeal is his movement. Gotta go fast, right? The adventure game struck an amazing balance of keeping that high octane speed while not feeling like the game is forcing me to go fast. Frontiers borrows its movement from the boost games pretty heavily, but tweaks things to have Sonic fit the larger scopes on offer. Sonic gets access to a few of his familiar moves. Of course you have the boost button so Sonic can speed through either the island itself or the many, many, many obstacle courses found traversing each island. You have the drop dash, which I never used because I didn't even remember I had it. In rounding out the familiar moves, you have the air boost and the homing attack. Quite the roster of moves to help Sonic speed through from place to place. Now Sonic won't be going from obstacle to obstacle all willy nilly. The island are inhabited by titans, our enemies, and Sonic has a whole set of moves tied to combat. I already mentioned the homing attack, but Sonic also has access to a default combo. 
mash the button enough, and Sonic will pull out some sweet moves to take down his enemies. Sonic also has access to this Etch-a-Sketch move called Psy Loop, where you can circle your targets to disarm them, or their shields temporarily, or to just deal standard damage. You also use Psy Loop to solve a lot of the world's puzzles, and as you level up by collecting skill points or doing air tricks, you'll gain access to even more skills. A personal Kamehameha with Sonic Boom, the ability to launch projectiles with a homing shot, and much, much more. With these moves, you'll tackle a variety of enemies from grunts which pose almost no challenge, to mini bosses that offer a bit of variety, to epic final bosses that have people losing their minds. Okay, I think that's everything in terms of the gameplay related to the open zone stuff. Normally, as I explain everything, I'd give my thoughts, tell you if it's good or bad, but for Frontiers, I thought it appropriate to lay everything out first. And with all that said, I think the open zone gameplay is... Fine? Starting off, I think Sonic controls relatively well all things considered. Obviously Sonic controls like he would traditionally in a boost game, but he's far slower. Personally speaking, I think the slower default speed is great, it allowed me to have near precise control of Sonic. And if I wanted to speed through a certain section, I could always boost, which serves its function rather well in my opinion. Transitioning from an obstacle course to the open world for the most part felt smooth, and it's when I think the game is at its highest. I'm sure I'm not the only one who sees a string of obstacles as a combo opportunity, and self-imposed the challenge of going through said combo without failing. Sonic Frontiers is the epitome of this philosophy. When you're zooming across the island for the first time, traversing new landscape and courses, Sonic Frontiers is one of the funnest experiences I've ever had in a Sonic game. I purposely went out of my way to do everything in this game not only to provide the best narrative I could, but because I wanted to see the next thing. I wanted to collect things because that meant I'd see more of the world. You get what I mean. For the first time since Sonic Adventure 2, I feel like Sonic Team captured the essence of why we love Sonic so much. When you're hitting on all cylinders, man, Sonic Frontiers is one of the most satisfying games to get good at. I was skipping sections entirely just because I saw an alternate route that could get me there faster with a bit of skill, and you're incentivized to experiment with the paths you take finally giving us just a bit of player freedom. It finally feels like we have full control of the wheel, letting us take the game at our own pace. Traditional Sonic games are all about going as fast as you can to reach the end stage with some slight variance. In the adventure games we had a variety of different playstyles, but even these were still time focused. The boost game's entire philosophy is boosting your way to the end goal as fast as you can. I always felt like this limited Sonic's potential. The classics did have you going super fast, but there were times where you had to slow down and actually use your platforming skills to get through the level. Frontiers feels like a melding of the two ideas. While you do need to sometimes methodically platform through an obstacle course, there's plenty of opportunities to boost through them if you're skilled enough. That's what I mean by player freedom. You have the choice to either grow through the level design as intended or to completely skip it in favor of getting to the next place faster. There's no optimal choice here. They're both totally fine options to experience the level design. It's such a little thing, but it completely changes the context of how you approach each part of the world. For reference, say you come to the start of an obstacle course. Most of the time you have about four to five ways to approach it, varying from starting right at the beginning or trying to skip some of it by approaching it from a different angle. Then when you're doing the course, you can, as I mentioned earlier, go through it as intended or boost through it. In that example alone, you have about six to seven different options, not including just skipping the course and finding another way around, which will in turn let you see more of the level design. This is exactly what I wanted from an open world styled Sonic game. Give me the options to see things the way I want to see them. It was so refreshing to finally finally have full control of Sonic for the first time in a long time. However, it's not perfect. From a technical perspective, this game might honestly be one of the worst games I've played in a long time. For context, I played on PC and was actually able to hack in widescreen, so while you see this, I was playing like this. And I rarely, if ever had any frame drops, maintaining a smooth 60 FPS throughout my experience. And when it comes to the performance, that's where the positives end. I'm sure you've noticed watching the video, but the amount of poppin' is disgusting. From the minute you start exploring the first island it's present, and only gets worse as you get further in the game. It's so terrible that sometimes I wasn't able to properly plan my route because as I ran across the open field, something would literally pop in, causing me to rethink where I wanted to go. Sometimes I would redo the same obstacle course when I'd return to an area because it'd pop in having me believe I didn't do it in the first place. I know there's a lot of reasons that had to be the case. I mean, there's almost no loading throughout your time with the game, but wow is it ever the most jarring thing to look at constantly. And this game maxing out at 60 FPS? You serious? I get factoring in the lowest common denominator, but come on. Some of us play primarily on PC so we can get the best performance experience possible. Not giving us that option leaves a very sour taste in my mouth. Does all this absolutely ruin the experience? No, absolutely not. But it's just crazy to me that even now after five long years, after the mishap with forces, Sonic's team still doesn't understand how to add polish to their games. Look at the UI, it just looks ugly. It's going for this minimalist vibe, but it still looks too busy to me. 
The lack of a minimap was shocking to me. I understand game development is insanely difficult, but I'm sorry, I have to call it as I see it, and when other Sega published games have more polish, there's really no excuse. And for as much praise as I gave the open zone gameplay in the movement, there is just as much that I have to criticize. While Sonic for the most part feels smooth to move, there are certain times where you will just lose all control of Sonic, and he will fly somewhere where you just did not want him to. It really hammers how unpolished this game feels. And while I think the slower speed for the most part is fine, I did sometimes wish Sonic would go faster. Some enemies in particular highlight how slow Sonic can go. It didn't happen too often for me, but I'd be lying if it didn't bother me from time to time. And for the most part, the obstacle courses are a fun way to traverse the island. The game is spread across five different islands. One of the islands is mainly used for story, so we won't count that one, in total leaving us with four large landscapes to explore. The first two islands, I think, are designed almost perfectly, superbly spreading out the ground traversal and the obstacle courses. I really feel like we get some of the best Sonic gameplay in these first two islands, but again, I haven't played all the games leading up to this one. But the final two islands take a nosedive so severe, I won't hesitate in saying this is some of the worst Sonic gameplay I've ever experienced. Most of the obstacle courses on the first two islands are perfectly spread out of 3D segments and 2D segments. Someone clearly got lazy or the entire team thought the first two islands were enough because almost every obstacle course on the last two islands are 2D. And on top of that, they're some of the worst 2D segments in the game. I won't shy away from saying this. I'm not a huge 2D Sonic guy. While I recognize that 2D Sonic is very important in the history of gaming or whatever, the 3D titles always spoke to me a bit more. They really dived into that 90s edginess I grew up alongside. So, even if it is just nostalgia, 3D Sonic is my preferred type of Sonic. Being forced to interact with 2D segments on the regular completely destroys the immersion frontiers presented early on. They feel so forced in, almost compensating for not having enough, even though I think with cyberspace, there's more than enough 2D sections. I don't get that same sense of exploration knowing that a 2D course is just around the corner. To me, it stands against what Frontiers wants to be. Frontiers was advertised as a sprawling, open zone experience where you can freely move Sonic wherever you want. You can't exactly do that when every single crevice of the landscape wants you to go into a 2D segment. And while the combat aesthetically looks cool, reminding me of a shonen anime, Mechanically, it's trash. The homing attack will sometimes just not target the right area. Again, I'm using a widescreen hack so the cursor is a bit off, but that doesn't affect where Sonic actually targets. I'll be trying to go for one grunt and homing attack into one that's shielded, causing me to lose rings. And none of the special moves stand out from one another. More often than not, I'd use the kick move or the standard combo since it was the fastest, most efficient way of defeating the Titans. And man, the later moves were really disappointing. The biggest one was the cross shot, being almost identical in function to Sonic Boom, but but in practice, being significantly worse. Why would I ever use a move that forcibly moves Sonic in a direction for a shorter period of time when I can do Sonic Boom to just instantly murder someone? Combat just doesn't feel satisfying to engage with. I, more often than not, ran away from enemies since they don't provide anything meaningful you can't already find in the world. The boss fights definitely live up to the hype, having some of the best music in the game and visually mimicking a shonen anime final boss fight. But with these two mechanically, there's almost nothing here. Just like the standard enemies, they provide almost no challenge. I had zero trouble beating these, which was really disappointing. They're arguably my favorite part in the entire game, and I wish the gameplay mimicked the style. The combat just leaves me wanting more. The style is certainly here. It never gets old hearing Sonic scream as he releases a sequence of kicks with Sonic Boom. But there's no substance, no depth to any of the enemy encounters. At the end of the day, you'll most likely side loop to bring their defense down before releasing a barrage of automated attacks. It's certainly not the worst part of the game, but at most, this provides a blueprint for what Sonic could be with more refinement and dedication to the combat. Obviously, as you level up, you're going to be dishing out more damage and receiving less damage when you take a hit, which here means losing less ranks with each hit. You also have the ability to level up your speed and ring count. In concept, this is brilliant. It only makes sense that you'll get stronger as you explore each area. But in execution? God, this is terrible! So to level up your speed and ring counts, you need to find Cocos. You're gonna find these just by exploring the world, at the end of obstacle courses, etc. You'll give them to the Hermit Coco, who in turn lets you choose which of the two you'd like to upgrade. One level at a time. Leveling up your attack and defense is much easier, but it is a much better. All of the upgrades you get don't really change how the game feels. The sliders do that just fine. There's this enemy called the squid, right? Early on, it takes forever to catch up to him, which makes this encounter last a lot longer than necessary. Later on, you'll fight the squid again, with your speed level probably at a much higher level. Instead of Sonic feeling faster, which is the point of a speed upgrade, the squid almost feels slower. 
Sure, it makes the encounter much shorter, but it always bothered me every time I noticed it since it never felt like my speed upgraded. Your attack does increase as you level it up, but by so much that every encounter becomes even less of a challenge than it already was, including the boss fights. However, the worst upgrade has to be increasing your ring count. So in the beginning, you can have up to 400 rings at a time. When you max out your ring count, Sonic will do a quick Kaioken transformation and go into boost mode. When in boost mode, Sonic will kick into hyperdrive when boosting. It's almost essential if you want to attain any sort of speed here. So if you level up your ring count, you'll have to collect more rings to enter boost mode. See where the problem is? Why the hell would you ever want to increase your ring count if it makes getting the speed boost more difficult? It's so counterintuitive combined with the defense stat reducing your lost rings every time you take damage. I avoided this like the plague until I learned there was an achievement behind it, only leveling up when I was done exploring the final island. Like I said, in concept, the level up system is awesome. It ties in very well with the open zone exploration, but the execution is so shockingly bad the game would be better off without it. I know exactly why it's here, and where the inspiration came from, but to me, it's redundant and causes more problems than the benefits it attempts to provide. To close off the open zone portion, I'd like to end it on a positive note by talking about the music. Stop me if you've heard this before. Sonic more often than not always has a banger soundtrack, and Frontiers is no different. While in the open zones, you'll have these ambient tunes that fit the visual aesthetic of each area you explore. The music will ramp up against the mini bosses. and the boss music, the peak of the entire soundtrack, delivering these hype as all hell vocalized tracks that fit the emotional impact the final boss should deliver. Even if the game has a lot of problems, and it has a lot of problems, the soundtrack is not one of them. I would say I still prefer Sonic Adventure 2's soundtrack more, but Frontiers tunes come in at a very close second. Overall, the open zone stuff was the best part of Frontiers for me hands down. Don't get it twisted, the game is far from perfect. It's a technical nightmare and has far too many issues with it for it to be considered anything special. But at the end of the day, I still had fun with this concept. The last two islands are garbage. I stand by that, but I can't deny the enjoyment I got from the first two islands. As I said earlier, when Sonic Frontiers is firing on all cylinders, there's really nothing like it. The exhilaration you get when things click is unrivaled. It constantly left me with a smile on my face. But there's so much that bogs it down, it becomes too much to ignore. And I really wanted to give Frontiers the benefit of the doubt. I really Really did. Then I remembered cyberspaces in this game and it angers me so much. Let me echo almost all the other thoughts you've heard in other videos. Cyberspace is the worst part of Sonic Frontiers, for more reasons than one. To start, while I think Sonic's slow speed for the most part isn't terrible, levels that force you to speed through them highlight why the slow speed can be a problem. Thought your speed upgrade was going to transfer into these? Nah, they won't. You're stuck with what Sonic Team considers appropriate for these stages, and just, wow, look at this! Sonic speed is ass! He's so fucking slow! That's right, not going to bleep out the cusses here, Cyberspace just wills it out of me. I stupidly went ahead and S-ranked every mission just to show you how garbage these levels are. Some of them are way too easy and I got the S-rank on my first try. Others took me so many attempts I had to put the controller down for a few minutes before I restarted. So on top of having nerfed Sonic controls, we have inconsistent difficulty. Oh, and that's just the beginning! No beating around the bush. The Cyberspace level designs are not only the worst I've experienced in a Sonic game, they might be the worst I've experienced in a platforming game. I'm not gonna comment on the reused level design. I recognized a few things, but I'd say a majority I was seeing for the first time. How do I explain this? It makes no sense. The level design does not complement Sonic's shitty gameplay in these levels. The paths you think you're supposed to take might not lead you to the fastest route to complete the level. Some levels start with the red ring on a hidden path. Sometimes you won't get enough rings to complete the S rank on your first try. So on and so forth, it's infuriating. You don't have to do cyberspace, but the game encourages you to do so. And as a Sonic fan, I want to experience everything in the game. The cyberspace levels not only validate almost every reason I have for not playing the boost games, it actively makes me want to avoid these games. I'm sure the gameplay and the boost games are more accommodating than the cyberspace levels, but having to actually go through the level design in this slow manner makes me think I wouldn't enjoy them anymore if they went faster. I'd leave all the cyberspace levels to last just because I knew it pissed me off, so I figured I might as well get all the garbage out of the way all at once. I hate cyberspace so much that going on this long about it is starting to bother me. So to stay sane and keep this video going, let's talk about the story. B 
people were certainly excited. I mean, they brought in Ian Flynn to write it. Again, I have zero history with the comics. Didn't have any idea what to expect. What do I think? It's not terrible. I can say that much. I mean, I would argue the dialogue Flynn wrote for the cast isn't good, but the whole story isn't garbage. Rather than just go over beat by beat like I normally would, let me just talk about the story as a whole. So it seems like Eggman's plan was to use this female AI avatar, Sage, to trap Sonic and friends in cyberspace to destroy them. Eggman got caught up while trying to set up this trap, and he can't get out. While Sonic tries to figure out how to get Eggman out of cyberspace, Sonic looks across the Starfall Islands for his friends. Now the story gets separated into three different arcs, if you will. We have the hero versus villain arc, pitting Sonic against Sage and Eggman, the friends arc, which sees Sonic's friends finally have a real character development, and the ancients arc, which sees Sonic and friends learn the origins of Starfall Island's ancestors. So let's talk about each of them individually, what I think, and then wrap this bad boy up. And what better way to start than with the worst arc in my opinion, Sonic vs. Sage. This is really weird. So Eggman developed Sage, right? He's the reason she's alive, but he doesn't show up besides a few cutscenes until the very last island, and he only shows up once or twice there. So to call this Sonic vs. Eggman isn't appropriate. This is Sonic vs. Sage. No two ways about it. At first, Sage despises Sonic, seeing as she's the culmination of Eggman's work, she's programmed to hate Sonic. Sonic, on the other hand, has no idea who Sage is, and only wants to help her along with helping his friends. It's such an odd dynamic in this game. No real quips from Sonic, he just wants to go out of his way and help everyone. You'll learn more about Sage through the side stories, and it's intended to not only develop the relationship between Sonic and Sage, but also to help teach you about the island's origins. As time goes on and Sonic saves more of his friends, Sage starts to warm up to Sonic. By the final island, Sage fully believes in Sonic to save the day, and decides to drop her quarrel with him so they can save the Starfall Islands. Honestly as a whole, this is filler for me. On the surface, Sage isn't anything interesting, she's kind of bland for what I like, but she's not terrible. This more caring Sonic though, he's really interesting. I don't think Sonic's amazing, but I like him taking the situation more seriously, and as naive as he sounds, caring about his adversaries. Sonic is very conscious that Sage is the one who's hurling the titans at him, but he doesn't let that destroy his core value. It's like he's taking all the experience he's garnered to this point to assess every situation on an individual basis, but more on that later. Sage isn't doing a great job, but Sonic does enough to make the eventual goody-goody turn from Sage make sense. Something I don't hear people mentioning is what Sage represents. I've heard a lot of people celebrating that she's a great addition to the cast, and while I won't speak on that, Sage to me anyways, represents something bigger. If we are to believe that Eggman created Sage, then doesn't it stand to reason that Eggman somewhere deep down not only respects Sonic like he says, but actually likes him? AI is a tricky thing to decipher. Sage probably gained some form of independence to come to her own conclusion on Sonic, but think about it. It completely recontextualizes Eggman's relationship with Sonic. Sonic and Eggman have been through a lot together. Over 30 years of constant squabbling, it not only takes its toll on you, it also allows you to completely learn about your opponent. If we look at this from an in-universe perspective, Eggman, as smart as he is, probably started to think about his relationship with Sonic. Maybe Sage was at the very least the start of them mending their relationship. Sure, it sounds crazy, but it's clear that past events have on all these characters. Eggman has worked with Sonic before. Maybe he's starting to see the bigger picture, and if the rest of the story is anything to go off, things are certainly going to change. On to the Ancients arc, where Sonic and friends discover the origin of the Cocos. Right out of the gate, they look almost identical to Chaos from Sonic Adventure. That has to mean something, right? Okay, I'll get back to that, but the ancient story will primarily be what you learn while doing the main story with one of Sonic's friends. Amy's has you rekindling old love, Knuckles has you getting reinforcements to an old battlefield, and Tails has you learning about the technological advancements the ancients achieved. It was pretty cute, I won't lie. Every time you defeat one of the final boss titans, you learn that the titan you defeated was piloted by one of the ancients. Four brave ancients got together to stop this force that aimed to destroy the planet. They were successful in sealing it away, but it cost them their lives. Sonic doesn't have that much of an active role this time around. Knuckles, Tails, or Amy will take center stage, and Sonic is just kind of around for the ride. The cutscenes with the agents are just visual short stories to tell us what happened once we connect the Coco with the corresponding area. The interesting bit here has to do with what I mentioned about Chaos. According to the internet, Chaos was the first known guardian of the Master Emerald. If we think about it strictly from a timeline perspective, Frontiers establishes that the Starfile Islands could have been the inspiration for a lot of other places such as Angel Island or vice versa. So there's reason to believe that Chaos is actually the last ancient still walking when we see it in Sonic Adventure. Isn't that nuts? 
Continuity is something I always enjoy, even if I have to fan theory from the little bit I know. That's really all I got from the ancient arc? A fun little theory I get to think is true. Lastly, we have the friends arc, where the real meat and potatoes are for me. To speak to your friends, you gotta collect a trinket unique to each character. Speaking to them not only progresses the main story, as well as the arc with the ancients, these scenes act as character development for our main cast. And let me just say, out of all the garbage we got, out of all the nonsense we still need to get through, this was very, very, very nice. Sonic the Hedgehog is a franchise aimed at pleasing kids. It's hard to find anything to grasp onto besides gameplay as an adult in my opinion. But things boomers like me look for, like continuity and character development, are fully embraced in the Friends arc. Sonic Team is finally acknowledging that Sonic has done enough. He has no more development in this current story. He's done it all, so Sonic acts like a mentor to his friends who are still trying to figure things out. Amy wants to try and find herself, and what she can do to be useful to the group. Knuckles ponders his purpose and decides he needs some time on Angel Island alone to figure things out. And Tails finally admits he's a giant weenie baby needing to go on his own to get stronger. Is any of this amazing, generally speaking? Nah, this is stuff I'd expect from any other story. But to finally get it in Sonic feels so rewarding as a fan. While the gameplay was the main reason I didn't play the boost games, the stories from what I've seen don't paint the blue blur in a good light. That goes doubly so for his friends. I've heard horror stories of what happened to Tails and Forces. And it's not amazing. The actual dialogue is pretty poor in my opinion, but the implications for what this sets up make the future of Sonic very interesting to me. We might have a Sonic game where Sonic is by himself, no buddy with him on site, presenting an opportunity to go full in on a darker story. I doubt that's what's going to happen, but the idea is no longer just a pipe dream. The time I spent in the Friends arc was the first real and probably the only time I enjoyed the story. The other two arcs have nice moments and give some good opportunities to fan out a bit, but as a whole, are pretty boring. The Friends arc, while not having the same level of excitement as the other two, provides easily the best story experience in the entire game. Again, maybe it's because I've grown up with Sonic and I've wanted to see these characters adapt and evolve past the tropes they used to embody. While the Friends arc doesn't give me all of that, it at least takes a first step in the right direction. I can't wait to see what happens to these three the next time we see them, and I can only imagine what this means for people who didn't show up this time around. Imagine Shadow? Yeah, you know, I'm not gonna do that. Let's just hope that in the future, Ian Flynn continues to write stuff like this. Speaking of which, I haven't even taken the time to talk about the voice cast since that's a really big deal to people who like Sonic apparently. I think this voice cast, aside from one exception, is AWFUL! Listen, I watch a lot of anime, most of it dubbed, so I don't claim to be this genius when it comes to voice actors, but I have a general understanding. These performances have to be some of the most uneven of all time. To highlight the one positive, Colleen O'Shaughnessy is still doing a killer job as Tails, piggybacking off his awesome debut in the second movie. But it ends there. Everyone else? Ass. They don't fit their characters at all. Knuckles sounds constipated as hell. It was the most alone I've ever felt. And at the same time, I was drowning in terrible visions and emotions. Like I said, nightmare. Amy sounds like she lost her keys and can't find them. I feel like the dimension I'm in is translating for me. It's strange, but feels natural. Sage is fine, I guess. No major complaints here. Sonic and Eggman. <laughs> They might have gotten the shortest end of the stick. Eggman sounds like he's been put on a sedative and doesn't know where he is. I'm sorry, that's all I hear. Oh, I hate that hedgehog. That doesn't change the fact that he is a formidable adversary. I respect him, but I don't have to like him. And Sonic, wow, if you ever needed more of a reason not to like Roger Craig Smith as Sonic, this performance is the one. I know the people that don't like Roger will say he sounds like a 40 year old playing Sonic, and in the little time and generations I played, I didn't get that vibe. But here it sounds like Sonic is constantly trying to find his Christian Bale Batman voice. There's just this soft grizzle in his tone that really shows how much Roger is overacting every time Sonic speaks. It's rough, man. No, but I'm also worried about you. You can't help anyone if you're stuck in limbo. I'm Batman. I don't know. Maybe I have some weird taste in my voice actors, but this cast isn't it. I didn't think it was possible for a Sonic character to bore me so much that I actively tuned out the story just so I wouldn't hear them talk. I'm used to hearing Robbie Damon, Greg Chun, and Max Middleman. Some voice acting goats in my opinion. It makes these awful performances stand out that much more. Not great at all. And to close things off, we have the end. No, not the final story. All that consists of is Eggman deciding to work with Sonic after Sage convinces him to do so. It's lame as hell. I'm talking about the end as in the final boss you face when you beat the game on hard mode. Oh dear lord, 
you got this garbage ass on rail shoot 'em up section where you don't even play as Sonic. Mechanically, it's trash. We do this a few times throughout the game and it's never fun. Not even once. It's like Galaga or Asteroids or something. I don't know. I can't even find it in me to care. And thematically, wow. You're joking, right? The entire time Sonic has been chatting with Sage, he's always wanted to help her. It's only fitting that before the garbage final boss fight, Sonic asks Sage for help. The perfect way to ruin the story in my opinion. Sage, over the course of the entire story, has come to see and respect Sonic for the legendary hero he is. I don't get why Sonic couldn't handle the giant planet himself. He made quick work of the Titans, he could have handled it. Instead of getting this rewarding final moment, we're forced into arguably the worst section of the game besides cyberspace. I don't hesitate in saying this might be the worst final boss I've ever encountered in a video game. It not only fails from a gameplay perspective, it fails in delivering the hype we as the player earned playing the game. And I'm left wondering, how? How could you do this to us? How could you rob us of this moment? As a whole, I'd say I'm pretty lukewarm on the story. Besides my fanboying, there's nothing here in Frontiers that I think is genuinely good. But the boss fights were one of the best parts of the game. They all delivered in terms of hype. It felt like an Attack on Titan encounter. Ah, it was awesome! In the end, however, like most of the game, I was left disappointed. Now we come to my least favorite section, the part where I need to summarize everything. In this case in particular, this section is quite difficult for me to talk about. I struggle to say I hate Sonic Frontiers. I would say there's only about 25% of this game that I think is genuinely good. When you're exploring the open zones at near breakneck speeds, there's nothing like it. Jumping from obstacle course to obstacle course, skipping entire sections of an island, there's just no feeling like it. However, there's so much wrong here that I can't in good conscience ignore it, regardless of how much I love Sonic. The performance, especially on PC, is piss poor for 2022 standards. Only two out of the four main islands are genuinely good. The story isn't anything to write home about unless you really like Sonic. Cyberspace can go fuck itself! And the ending leaves such a bitter taste in my mouth it has me question my overall feelings on the game. I don't think Sonic Frontiers is a good game. I also don't think it's a bad game. To me, Sonic Frontiers is a proof of concept that has many stumbles. It stumbles so much that for a lot of people, it'll probably ruin the entire experience. But even if it was just a smidge, there was an idea here that with more time, can be something that brings Sonic back to where he belongs. I don't regret playing Sonic Frontiers. I was able to get something out of the time I spent with it. I took work off for this game and I had a blast my first day with it. I had fun. And isn't that what video games are for at the end of the day? I hope Sonic Team looks at the review scores they're getting and are happy with what they were able to achieve, even if I don't agree with it. On the flip side, however, I hope Sonic Team sees the many valid criticisms this game has gotten and try to improve. That hasn't tended to be the case, but they say negativity is bad for your skin, right? I'm gonna be cautiously optimistic going forward. And this is usually the part where I would end the video with a nice bow tie, but there's something else I'd like to discuss today. A topic I thought I'd never talk about on my channel, but one I feel I need to discuss. Originally, this wasn't a video I was intending to make. I certainly wanted to, but there's a big reason I initially wasn't going to. The fandom surrounding Sonic is a bit too much for a guy like me to bear. For reference, I work a full-time job. This isn't what I do for a living as it stands. It's something I hope to achieve and I hope this video is one of the projects to help me get to that point. But I've seen what happens when people disagree about Sonic. I'm not the type of viewer to dive into the comment section of videos I watch, but for research purposes I did. And man, there was some vile stuff out there. Most I don't feel comfortable sharing. I didn't want any sort of video of mine to go viral for negative reasons such as those. Video games are for everyone, so I'd like to avoid as much of the noise as I can. So I had another project planned entirely. Here's the thumbnail for what it was going to be in case you were curious. Then a certain video from a content creator I have the utmost respect for dropped on my feed. The video I'm referencing titled Sonic Fan Tears Review was created by JebTube. And I'm watching this video, minding my business when I hear this. Of course, I would give my opinion on why it's not, from every angle down to the marketing. And every time I did this, who cares? Touch grass, play other games, no one likes you, blah. <laughs> okay, understood. Sonic fans don't want improvement. They don't want it, take it back. They don't want things to be better. It's perfectly good as is. After hearing this, I knew that I couldn't hold the urge any longer. I had to talk about Sonic Frontiers. The reason being is because I totally agree. He's right, Sonic fans don't want improvement. The amount of posts I've seen declaring Sonic is back is exhausting. And while I hardly think the game is outright garbage, I can't find it in me to agree with the sentiment that Sonic is back. There's just too many problems here people are willing to ignore, and that's fine. These videos, like all videos of this nature, are not to tell you what you should or should not like. 
If Sonic the Hedgehog is your favorite franchise, that's good. I'm happy for you. And if you're happy with the product that we've gotten for the last 10 plus years, then more power to you. But to me, I'm unsatisfied with Sonic even after Frontiers. And this video is almost a love letter to how I feel. I want Sonic to give me that feeling I got as a kid playing Sonic Adventure 2. Sonic Frontiers does in glimpses, but as a whole didn't deliver the experience I wanted. And that's okay, because someone out there got exactly what they were looking for. However, it's not okay to just trash on someone's entire life because they didn't agree with your Sonic take. Content creators being afraid to do their job on a game they want to talk about is not right, and it shouldn't even be a thing that happens anymore. It annoys me to even point it out, but if you don't want improvement, then cool, don't expect better. Just ignore people like me who do expect better. Video games are subjective. My favorite game is almost certainly not yours. So it's okay if we have different opinions on things. It's what makes video games such an appealing subject matter. I've met lots of very good friends through video games. It's opened up opportunities I only dreamed of. And to me anyways, video games are a way for me to disconnect from my real life and the stresses it entails. It really makes me sad to hear people are afraid to make Sonic videos because they're afraid of the hate they might get. As someone with some experience with mental health trauma, I urge you to think before you type that hate comment if you disagree with any of the takes out there. We want to engage with you and welcome you into our community. I can't exactly do that if you hurl insults at me. To Jeb specifically, all I can do is thank you for paving the way. You laid the groundwork out for this to even be a reality. You spoke up for us, and it's something I won't take for granted. Whether Sonic is for me going forward is to be determined. I prefer to take things as they come because there's a lot of other games I'm more interested in. Ironically enough, a lot of these things happen to be other Sega published titles. I'm hyped for what's to come for Like a Dragon. Persona is at the peak of its powers right now. I can't wait to see what Atlas does in the future. When it comes to future games, I'm spoken for. And for those excited for Sonic going forward, I hope you get what you want. Because I certainly got something, and I can only hope going forward, my frontier wasn't in vain.